čo, 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 hej, hej, hej.
Good morning. Hello, all, and thank you so much for, for coming out to our second annual TEDx UNC Pembroke for 2024. So, thank you. It's wonderful to have you all here, and um, we're really excited. This is our second um, annual event, and the last year was our inaugural event. It was organized by three amazing far overachieving undergraduate students, two of which have come back to um, this event to celebrate it with us. So um, thank them when you get the chance. Uh, that's Pisa Juro Tutu and Jalen Wilson in the crowd with us right now, and Hannah Irving, who couldn't make it. <clears throat> This year, our uh, theme is um, the next chapter in life. Um, when we began uh, organizing this, uh, myself, Gordon, and, um, and Rodney Smith, and Trilla, and also Ale, we, we knew we wanted a topic that would be engaging for, for anybody at any place in their life. And so uh, we're really excited to share with you amazing eight uh, talks on this subject of the next chapter in life. Um, and with no further ado, I want to introduce our host, Dr. Calvina Ellerby. We are so excited you guys are here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Again, this is our second annual. We could not be more thrilled that you guys took the time out to be here. As you said, my name is Dr. Calvina Ellaby, and I was blessed to take part in the first one to a t wonderful experience, and it's opened so many doors. So I'm super excited for the other speakers and the opportunities that will come their way and the opportunity to share their powerful stories. But I want to begin by taking the opportunity to thank our sponsors, because as y'all know, it takes money for everything. And so we want to thank them today, the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. Woohoo! Want to clap for us? <laughs> Lumberton Visitors Bureau and PostNet. <laughs> and last but not least, Sodexo. So um, there are some nice things out there for you guys today. Um, we would also like to give a special thanks to Chancellor Cummings, um, the head of this university that is definitely helping us grow and continue to be a frontier in education. Uh, we also want to thank Peace Ajiro Tutu, make sure I say your name correctly, Jalen Wilson, John Dunlap, and Vanda Dalawi. Also, Michaela, our photographer, and Justice Haygood on the selection committee. We want to thank them so much for the effort. It took so much to get this accomplished. It's not a small feat for sure. We are also grateful that you took the time to be here with us today. As you guys know, it takes so many things to bring us all in one room. I could have been somewhere, you could have been somewhere else, but we always want to take the opportunity to be grateful for the opportunity to be here and be present together and to grow together. This is a beautiful opportunity to enrich and expand our understanding of the world that we live in by listening to the eight powerhouse speakers we have lined up for you today. I hope you're excited and I hope you're prepared because it's going to be good. Hope y'all ready. So I hope you're ready to grow. And without further ado, I'm very excited to introduce our very first speaker. She is a professional speaker and disability consultant. She is a dynamic, quirky, quad, energizer bunny on wheels. So lean in and prepare to be transformed. Help me welcome Allie Ingersoll. When I was 27 years old, I thought I had my entire life planned out. I had a crystal clear vision of what each chapter of my life would look like and where I was supposed to be at different points. I had a very unusual and eclectic upbringing. I grew up with European parents internationally in Catholic nun boarding school where nuns were allowed to beat you back then. I moved every two years of my life. I engaged in global wilderness survival programs around the planet and our home base was an island, out island in the Bahamas called Cat Island. I even moved to China when I was 16 years old. My Italian kickboxing instructor boyfriend did not speak English, and I did not speak Italian. I learned the language very quickly. Young love will do that to you. We even went to jail together in China near the Mongolian border in sub-zero temperatures, a mother's worst nightmare. If you are intrigued about what it's like to go to jail in China, that's my next TEDx talk. 
In my formidable 20s, I went from frequenting the Playboy Mansion, because that was a really great life decision, to majoring in entrepreneurship and winning business plan competitions in Miami. I then worked for a prominent political family, jaded by politics. I moved back home to the Bahamas and put myself through a 12,000 page technical analysis day trading course. My days were spent with crystal clear water, studying and smoking cigars with the most intelligent man I know, my dad under a tiki hut bar at sunset. Life was great, it was really great. Then came August 21st, 2010. Just a typical day in the Bahamas. I vividly remember saying to my mother, I love my life. I was so grateful for my life and my rockin' body. A mere 10 minutes later, I take a dive of a tiki hut bar into water. I didn't notice how shallow it was. I dive head first into sand, bam! Paralyzed instantly, and I knew it. Floating fully conscious upside down in the water, I waited for what felt like an eternity to be saved. My mother knew something was wrong. A mother, she always knows. She flipped me over and she saved my life. We then had to direct her on medical care because there were no doctors on the island at that time. It took a Herculean 22 hour journey, walls of thunderstorms and multiple jets to rush me into surgery. The surgeon walked in my room and he told me, you were paralyzed from the chest down with paralyzed hands. I called them my paws, a quadriplegic. Initially unable to move, I knew my life would forever be different. I remember looking at him and thinking to myself, you think I'm paralyzed? Oh, and then from the next point in my life, I just kept questioning to myself, where was I going with my life? I also started to question, how much worse could it get? Never a great question to ask yourself. For the next seven straight years, I lived in and out of hospitals with 11 surgeries. My medical portfolio included pulmonary embolisms, osteoporosis, spinal cysts, cervical cancer, pressure sores, and chronic pain burning me alive, even as I'm on stage with you here right now today. Murphy and his law was kicking my butt 18 ways to Sunday. So it's a really good thing I can't feel my butt. I couldn't understand why this was happening to me. Life was not fair. Where did that come from anyway? Life is fair. I think it came from the 1980 Disney movies. Always a happy ending, right? Well, not quite yet for me. A few years later, I moved back to China for life-saving spinal surgery. They wouldn't operate on me in the United States. Let's call it liability reasons. I'm gonna stick with that story. My respiratory system was failing and I had months to live if I was lucky. Fortunately, I speak Chinese and I had to translate my own medical surgery. I would not highly recommend this. Fortunately, surgery was successful with a few twists. I woke up on ibuprofen only intubated, violently thrashing around, and the doctors tied me down to the bed with literal purple string. I passed out. After waking up from this nightmare, I was then overdosed on morphine. Not once, but twice. The walls were melting and the hallucinogenic spiders were coming down to attack me. I then commenced a rehab program where they proceeded to break my right leg in eight different places and they didn't cast it. Due to poor PT education and undiagnosed osteoporosis. I then spent the next year in and out of bed with pain so intense, I could barely form a sentence. This would become the darkest time of my life. I became suicidal. I told my family I would live for one year and if nothing changed, I wanted help to die. I felt so helpless and so hopeless, I couldn't understand the point of living this life. I would wake up each night in agonizing pain, crying, saying to myself, if I had the use of these hands, I would use them to kill myself. At this point, I realized I was not just physically paralyzed, worse, I was mentally paralyzed, 
unable to move. I became a voluntary hostage in my own life, trapped by my mindset, until I recall something my dad said to me in the ICU when I broke my neck. He said to me, kid, you broke your body, not your brain, get to work. Translation, your mind is your most powerful asset. You have to keep moving forward. As I started to just believe in a way forward again, life, it happened again, but there was a really big difference this time though. It was me. I accepted that I couldn't move physically, but I would mentally. Surviving and overcoming yet a serious, another serious adverse medical experience, it seemed possible. Simple, but consistent. I would wake up, I would day trade, I would read, I would exercise, and I connected with community, the disability community. I didn't feel so alone this time. And I started to use humor in my everyday life. The darker the humor, the funnier I try to become. I engaged in sexy ICU photo shoots with my mother in the ICU and racy online dating experiments that resulted in marriage and just recently divorced. Ah, uh, surviving and feeling a little less alone this time, it wasn't enough for me. I discovered my passion and my purpose, a purpose I would not have otherwise had if it had not been for my paralysis. After being denied medically in 2016, I developed this major pressure sore. And after being denied medically necessary equipment, I needed to physically survive in my life. Fighting for my life gave me something worth fighting for. Does it ever feel like your health insurance company may not have your best interests at heart? The slogan is not personal. It's business. It comes to mind. When I was denied this medically necessary equipment I needed to physically survive in my life, I started to fight back. And I started to win everything. And I am still standing, proverbially speaking. And you know how I did this? I learned to write letters of medical necessity, back them up by peer-reviewed journal articles, navigate the health insurance appeals process, and I started to win everything. I took this work national, working on different healthcare equity initiatives. This led me to be humbly crowned Miss Wheelchair America. I then worked with an incredible coalition in Washington, DC, where we worked tirelessly with Medicare for years, and we successfully changed landmark legislation through the use of power seat elevators, what you see me here today. A major, major victory for us here in the United States. Throughout my journey, I researched, discovered, and learned how to apply three concepts in my life to help me keep moving forward despite the pain. These center around re-examining happiness, success, and responsibility. In my quest for trying to live a normal life, I kept searching around happiness for every corner. Where was she? Because I couldn't find her. Research performed by Joseph and Lindley showed that up to 70% of people who overcome trauma report positive psychological growth and adversity makes you stronger. Hmm, Ad adversity did make me stronger, but it did not yet make me happier. I thought overcoming all of my obstacles in life would lead to some kind of miraculous transformation just by going through the motions of surviving. Until I flipped the script on the concept of happiness. I could still live my best life and keep moving forward just differently. For me, it started as being happy enough. Every time I would search for happiness, it would make me more miserable. I, because I kept trying to avoid pain and trauma. That's the problem with happiness. For so many of us, we are unable to avoid our pain or our trauma in life. To embrace the next chapter in life, that involves finding the problems that we enjoy solving, not the avoidance of our problems. Once I started to really grasp this idea that we have to choose the problems we enjoy solving, this is when the dots started to connect for me.
I'm now focusing on how to move forward and what is in my control by consistently move forward regardless of the outcome. And I started to redefine what success looked like. During my transformational year in bed, success, it did follow. But what do I mean by success? I transform my personal passion to survive into a shared collective purpose to pay it forward to others. I thought I just consistently shifted my mindset into thinking about what I do have, not what I don't have. For many of us, we have become the victims of our own success. We get anxious. We get doubly anxious. This causes more anxiety. Quick, where's the vodka and the processed sugar? It feels as though this is an epidemic where our crises are no longer material, but they're spiritual. I consistently went from thinking about how life is not fair, how I'm not successful, um, how I can't do this or that, to now focusing on what is in my control by consistently moving forward, regardless of what the outcome was going to be, positive or negative. This is where 100% responsibility comes into many of our lives. In order to assume responsibility, I must assume ownership of my present circumstances. As I'm constantly reminded by my dad's comments in the ICU, I have control of where I go with my life. Listen, I've been killed cardiac arrest about seven times in the hospital. You kind of lose count after three. But you know what? Fault, that's past tense. Responsibility, that is present tense, and it's action-focused. Fault results from choices we've already made. We can't do anything about those. Responsibility, now that results from choices we're making right now, every single second of every single day. I choose to take responsibility of my life 100% with respect to letting go of fault because I have control of where I go with my life. Whether this was from advancing healthcare equity initiatives, winning Miss Wheelchair America, now corporate disability inclusion consulting, keynote speaking, probably most importantly, dark humor in my everyday life. It wasn't until I replaced my power to control with my power to let go that I started to move forward. I broke free from paralysis and now help thousands of others break free from their own psychological paralysis. Now, I haven't quite cracked the code yet on how to reverse physical paralysis, but it's on my to-do list next year, PhD neuroscience, maybe, I, I think. In the meantime, I am so humbled to tell you a story of a friend of mine who came to me after she was denied a $30,000 medical bite by her insurance company. I worked with her to navigate the labyrinth of the health insurance appeals process, not so fun. And her insurance company was forced to overturn their decision by a government agency awarding her this $30,000 bike. An amazing day. I didn't do the work for her. I used the principles that guide my own life to help her take control of hers. This all centers around being your own self-advocate. This is no longer about me. This is about helping others advocate for themselves. One thing we all have in common, we experience life struggles. We question how we can move forward or if we can move forward. Maybe it's a relationship loss. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's unemployment. Maybe it's just a bad boss. It makes complete sense how we question how we can move forward or if there even is a next chapter in life sometimes. What I hope I have shared with you here today is not only that we can move forward despite life circumstances, case in point for me, but my idea truly spreads on how we move forward to help you. Because if a young woman at 27 who broke her neck not only survived in life and forged ahead to survive and thrive and become the Energizer Bunny on wheels 2.0, and we twist, so can you. Sometimes, though, it's just moment by moment. Other times, it's inch by inch. But we keep 
moving forward. Thank you. I told you, <laughs> amazing, just wow, just wow, just wow. Thank you so much, Allie, for reminding us of the overwhelming power of greatness, gratefulness and mindset shifting. It is important to think about how you think about the world, to address what you, how you're processing the things that come your way. We can only have the lives that we want when we choose to take responsibility for our own lives. This is simply life-changing. I hope you guys are thoroughly inspired. I know I am. So now that we have been effectively motivated to take control of our lives, let's get ready for another powerhouse speaker. Elizabeth Blake Thomas is a lecturer at Pepperdine University, director, author, mother, filmmaker, and creativity coach. She is devoted to helping others live on purpose. You are definitely in for another treat. Please help me welcome our next speaker, Elizabeth Blake Thomas. My daughter and I love playing games, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to start with a game. Ready, set, go. Count how many things you've done. Okay, raise your hand if you counted more than 10. Raise your hand if you counted less than 10. And keep your hand raised if it was less than five. Are there things on this list you would like to have counted? We're all going to die. It's how we get there that matters. And that journey is often referred to as the game of life. Who here has heard of or played the game of life? Okay, for those of you who haven't, the aim of the game is to get from age 18 to retirement, making major life decisions along the way. You begin by choosing one of two routes, the university route or the vocational route. And once you're through this first set, then you're put on a path that you are then stuck on all the way to retirement. You can choose marriage, kids, house purchases, oh, and don't forget the inevitable midlife crisis shown actually by the cartoon of the balding man and his sports car. The other day, I was at a friend's house, and she has two young children, both under the age of 10, and it was the inevitable bedtime routine. So in order to prolong this, they asked to play this game. I had no idea how playing a family-friendly board game was going to lead me to an existential crisis. I was astonished that even in 2024, this game only had one main path to move your pieces down. Now, don't get me wrong, they went to bed very happy with their fictional lives of well-paid jobs, made possible only through the university route, a plethora of children, big house purchases, leading to a fabulous retirement package. But as they were going up the stairs, I wanted to cry out, wait, what about the other paths? The paths that aren't shown on the board. A creative path, a travel path, a minimalist path. Now, I was led to believe that the correct way to live my life was following the game. I got my degree. I then got married. We bought a home. We had a beautiful daughter. I started my own company. But then I realized something, that just by following this path, I wasn't actually living. At age 30, I wasn't feeling fulfilled in my mind, body, and soul. It all felt very practical and monotonous, like I was just going through the motions. 
And I realized I didn't want to just keep rolling that dice to see where it landed on this one path. In the last 10 years, I've experienced four major chapters in my life with many lessons learnt along the way. Chapter one. Now this chapter taught me that a change doesn't just need to come from a career or a financial or familial situation. It can come from a location change, a total shift for your body. I live in Los Angeles, but as you can tell by my accent, I wasn't in fact born there. I was born in England, where yes, I know, the weather is grey <laughs> and it rains all the time. So age 35, I planned a trip from London to Los Angeles. This was initially intended to be a bit of a restart and a, and a reset to help me with my life back in the UK. But I'll never forget stepping off the plane and seeing the palm trees against the blue sky and, uh, and smelling the salty ocean and feeling the warm sunshine on my face. Oh, my body felt different. It, it felt free. And that quick holiday turned into me coming back for a longer holiday, which eventually turned into me moving. Now, it's easy to make that change sound simple and glamorous, but I just moved 6,000 miles away from my family and friends. I knew no one. I didn't know where I was going to live, and don't get me started on the visa process. So was this change daunting, scary? Totally. But I was more scared to have regrets about not choosing this unknown path. The Midas Project found that while some life transitions may initially cause stress or upheaval, they can also increase resilience, improved overall well-being over time. And this dynamic nature of human development and the importance of embracing personal growth and adaptation is key to our growth. Chapter two. This chapter taught me to be open and ready to accept all opportunities when they present themselves. My mind was expanded. Age 38, I witnessed a parent worrying about their child turning 18 and no longer needing them. Well, for context, my daughter is an actress and has been for many years, so I was her on-set guardian. This meant being there every day to protect her, help her, make sure she had everything that she needed. Now, this was my one and only job. And I quickly understood that when she turned into an adult and no longer legally needed me on set, that I would need to find an alternative job. Yes, I was at an age where people don't typically start something completely new, but I had been a theatre director back in the UK, and this industry didn't seem so far out of reach. Um, I knew I understood actors and story, so film could be the perfect next step. i would made several connections via my daughter's work, and one of those became a bit of a mentor. And he said to me, you should be a director. And I said, well, how? And he said six words that changed my life. You just say you're a director. This blew my mind. All I had to do was say it. So I took his advice and started introducing myself as a director. Now, I didn't have a degree in film, but I was open to learning everything in this hands-on way. In fact, so many creative careers can come just from doing. I was redefining my path. Researchers at UC Berkeley and other institutions found that exposure to new and challenging experiences can promote neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to reorganize and form new neural connections. The study demonstrated that these neuroplastic changes were associated with improved cognitive performance, and subjects exposed to enriched environments exhibited enhanced learning and memory abilities, as well as increased resilience to age-related cognitive decline. Chapter three. This chapter taught me that no job 
is worth sacrificing your physical or mental health over. My soul was challenged in a way that I'd not experienced before. Age 43, I'd now directed 15 feature films, and it's a very intense process making a movie. People become tired, emotions get heightened, but there's never an excuse for abusive behavior. And I was severely bullied on a film set. I'm not just talking some passive aggressive comments, I'm talking full on emotional and psychological abuse every day. Now, after this film, I went home. I, I sat and stared out of the window. I felt lost. I became anxious. And I was broken by an industry that I'd become very attached to. Therapy didn't seem quite right for me, but I knew I needed to do something. So I turned to mindfulness techniques. After many, many months, I began to feel more like myself again. And people I didn't even know commented on my positivity and joy. And I realized that I wasn't the only one looking to achieve this level of peace. So I founded a company that helped me share the methods that had put me back together. And this was my spiritual path. University of Chicago found that participants who'd undergone emotionally evocative experience showed accuracy when identifying the emotions of others compared to those who had not experienced such events. Chapter four. <laughs> this chapter taught me that by putting my time and energy into self-enrichment and personal growth, I could live my best life. My mind, body, and soul working as one. Age 44, I lived on a 34-foot 1978 boat, and I drove a seafoam green 1969 VW bus. Now remember, I'm British, so I have to do all things LA, including the handbag dog. I love this life. It was serene. I could watch the sun rise and sunset over the ocean every day. I, I even went paddleboarding every day. And I had two ducks that I adopted that lived on the back of my boat. So I was already going against societal norms for my lifestyle. But then I went one step further and totally veered off the path that I had created. I think I was somewhere near the gumdrop in Candyland. I sold everything. I realized that the boat and the bus were taking more time and energy from me than they gave. They were needing regular maintenance, the rust and mold were becoming a problem, and the upkeep was becoming more expensive. I got rid of everything because those things no longer served me. What I needed changed. And this was the minimalist path. Maslow's hierarchy of needs suggests that once basic physiological and safety needs are met, individuals seek to fulfill higher level needs, such as love and belonging, esteem and self-actualization, which are less dependent on material possessions. So I'd been on the unknown path, the redefined path, the spiritual path, and the minimalist path. What does my game of life look like now? Well, my current path doesn't even have a name yet. And that's okay, because it's an ever-changing journey. Now, the reason for the game at the beginning was to help you get started on your next chapter. Because you don't always need a big wake-up call. You don't need the threat of dying. It doesn't suddenly need to hit you that one day you will die, and no one around you needs to die. Hunter S. Thompson said that life should not be a journey to the grave with the intention of arriving safely in a well-preserved body, but rather to skid in broadside in a cloud of smoke, thoroughly worn out and loudly proclaiming, wow, what a ride. We are all going to die. It's how we get there that matters. Thank you. <laughs> Simply amazing. Thank you, thank you so much, Elizabeth. It is 
definitely undeniable that our brains are powerful machines and realizing that neuroplasticity is an ability that we hold at our fingertips that we should lean into. So many of us kind of stop before we realize that we actually have more power than you think. No more saying that we can't do things because they do not come easy to us. That's over. Thank you, Elizabeth. It's over now. We're all brand new. We have the power to create new neural pathways, and talks like this help us remember that. Are you guys ready for our next speaker? Hope you're ready. We are gearing up to shift gears just a little bit as we meet an organizational powerhouse. Michael Clegg helps organizational leaders develop into transforming leaders as the change starts within. That's what he helped them focus on. His journey is one worth remembering. I hope you guys are getting excited. Please join me in welcome, welcoming Michael Clegg to the stage. Now picture this, I'm an eight-year-old little boy standing at the top of a bunk bed, holding a small Bible, pretending to preach to the congregation below. But in reality, the only member of the congregation was my three-year-old little brother. But I was a pretty happy kid, full of ambition, tons of purpose in life that I wanted to achieve. And I had dreams of speaking in front of large audiences one day. But I also wanted to play in the NFL, too, so I guess achieving one out of two isn't bad. Now, I had a lifetime of dreams ahead of me. And limitations, for those of us that are parents, we understand that kids do not know limitations. Limitations are actually reserved for us as adults to use as excuses for reasons for why we cannot achieve the things we want in life. Now, as you can tell from the picture of my childhood home, my family didn't come from a lot of money. My dad worked and retired from the National Guard. My mom cleaned houses for extra cash on the side. And they were practically kids themselves. They were only 20 years older than me. And unfortunately, four years later, when I was 12, they divorced. And upon reflection, that was when I realized that I stopped focusing on my dreams and instead started reacting to the things that happened in life. But isn't that a trap that we all fall into, reacting to the day-to-day? -day? Now, ultimately, both of my parents remarried. My new stepdad, he was abusive. You know, one night, we were preparing for Taco Tuesday. And he was picking on me. That was not unusual. But this particular night, something was different. You know, the next thing I recall was laying on my back, looking up at my stepdad beating on me and seeing my mom pulling him up off of me. About a year later, my little sister was born, and it wasn't long after that my mom kicked my stepdad out for good. But regardless of the things that happen to you in life, whether you're a kid or as an adult, we all have a purpose to fulfill, and I truly believe that. Now, today I'm going to share with you how you can transform your life by adding a little bit of purpose and meaning into it. Now, I'm the CEO of a professional staffing firm, but I also coach high school football. That is as close as I got to the NFL, by the way. And this is a picture of my boys. This particular weekend, we were playing in the Southeast Championship Tournament, and we made it to the final game, which was awesome. What was not so awesome is that we actually had to play our crosstown rivals, a team that we hadn't beaten in almost seven years. And as usual, this was a very close, hard-fought game, but we came out on top. It was so awesome. I mean, the kids were fired up. The parents were off the charts excited, as you can imagine. And I just remember walking back to the truck, thinking about how proud of these boys that I was, not only about how hard they competed, but that they believed that they could win. And so I hop in my truck, and I've got about a 45-minute trip home, this long, dark countryside highway. 
And I'm telling you, it was dark. It was so dark that I could barely see the bridge up ahead. It was so dark that I had zero chance of seeing that person standing on top of the bridge about to jump off in front of my truck. I didn't see him. I didn't see him until it was too late. And it happened so fast. I didn't have a chance to stop or to stir to avoid running over top of him. I can still hear the sound and feel the impact. It was absolutely gut-wrenching. Sheer terror is ripping through my body. And all I could think of was pulling off of the side of the road as quickly as I could so I could run back and help. So I jump out of the truck, and I'm running. I'm sprinting up the shoulder, and I can still hear their cars on the opposite side of the highway, swishing by at full speed, and images of the headlights of oncoming traffic. And as I'm running, I'm thinking, maybe it's not that bad. Maybe they're okay. But as I, as I get closer, reality started to set in. He didn't make it. He was dead. And these are no images that any human being should ever have to see. What laid here was a lifeless shell of a man that was somebody's son, maybe a dad, a brother, someone's best friend. But now what lays is a lifeless shell of a human being that's a middle-aged man wearing a gray hooded tracksuit with shoes scattered across the road, one sock half on, the other sock is missing. And I couldn't stop thinking, why did he jump? Did he ever consider? Did he ever consider the danger that he was going to put us in? If I would have arrived a split second sooner, and I stopped myself and I go, Clegg, how awful of me to think about something like that in a moment like this. It was a long night. The next day, I I wake up to hundreds of messages, kind messages. But I didn't want to get out of bed. But I knew I needed to see a therapist later that day. I felt judged. I felt so helpless. I don't know. Maybe I was just having a pity party for one. But there's an awesome quote by Dr. Peter Levin that says, trauma is not what happens to you, but it's what we hold inside in the absence of an empathetic witness. I spent hours later that day with the therapist, and she became that empathetic witness. I don't remember much of the conversation. I remember there were long periods of silence. I was staring up at the ceiling looking down at my shoes, looking out the window. But she never judged. She just gave me space. Space to just be. And isn't that what an empathetic witness is supposed to do? You know, months following the accident, you know, I was still struggling. I was suffering silently inside. I really struggled. As time continued to move on, I knew that things had to change. Because I was negatively reacting to so many things in life. I wasn't being present in the most important areas of my life like family and business. And so that's when the transformation began. And I I discovered a concept by Dr. Benjamin Hardy called Be In Your Future Self Now. And I watched videos of transformation, read books about purpose and meaning. Something inside of me started to stir, man. It was like this magnetic pull that I couldn't resist. So I joined this mastermind group where I started doing some deep work. Started journaling. I never journal. Started deeply reflecting on my past, inspecting all of the key areas of my life. The things that I was doing prior to the accident, I would have considered as being too woo-woo or fluffy. 
But in reality, those were the tools that I used to stop dwelling on the accident and what happened to me. And instead, I started focusing on being my future self and what I was going to be. Everything started to change. I mean, it was magic. I started thinking like that little eight-year-old boy again with ambition and purpose. And I want this for you guys too. Because we all are going to experience some level of trauma somewhere in our lives. But before we become our future self, we have to understand what are the limitations that we have? What are the excuses that we use? What are the lies that we tell ourselves? My favorite, I don't have time. How many of us use that every single day? I don't have time. I tell my kids you're the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. Because we become our environment. And I was very blessed to have an environment that helped me through my recovery, helped me take the beginning steps of becoming my future self. I mean, when I started journaling, I realized that I had lost a decade of my life. 10 years, I was no longer thinking of future success. I was living what I call the default future, which is living in the day-to-day. How many of us live in the day-to-day? into that default future. It's impactful. But some of the things that we have to understand is that change is inevitable. And I want you to understand a few things. That we can't live that default future because if patients that are on their deathbed the number one regret that they have is that they did not have the courage to live lives true to themselves, but instead by the expectation of others. If you don't make changes today, what regrets are you going to have on your deathbed? And I hate to tell you, we're all going to be there at one point. But I can promise that if you start searching for purpose and meaning in your life, you won't have those regrets. Now, there are three questions that I want you to pay close attention to. Take home to your family and your friends and ask yourself these three questions. The first question is, who is your future self? Now, if you were to have fun and write a letter from five years into your future to your current self today, what advice would you give yourself? Number two, where are you living the default future? If you don't make changes today to the things that are going on in the day-to-day to life, what does your future self look like? And number three, if you don't remove those limitations, those excuses, those lies that we tell ourselves, if you don't remove those, what's your future self look like? I mean, think about it. If you had the courage and the resources and you knew you couldn't fail, what would you pursue in life? Now, this journey of becoming my future self started almost six months ago. And I have started dreaming big. One of my visions is to humanize 100,000 conscious leaders in corporate America. I want to expand and become a professional speaker to share this message and others. And my favorite vision was, within five years, I wanted to get on a TEDx stage and tell this story. But because I was taking steps of becoming my future self, it happened in five months. The power of your future self is real. Embrace it. Now, I wish I could go back to that fateful night and find that gentleman on the bridge before he jumped. And I would speak to him like I'm speaking to you. I would ask him the same questions that I ask you. No judgment. I just listen. 
I would help him find that empathetic witness. Help him identify the steps of becoming his future self before it was too late. But we know that is not possible. I can't go speak to him. But what is possible is that we can share this message of hope to millions around the world. You know, that night of the accident, I thought that my rival was that crosstown football team. But as I started taking the steps on this journey of becoming my future self, I realized that the real rival was me. Thank you. Once again, thank you so much, Michael. Our journey to not living with regret starts today. I hope you guys have fully received that message. So many of us live with regrets. We cannot wait until another time. We can't assume that we're going to get the opportunity. We have to show up fully to every day and every moment. And the idea that we have time is really a mirage. We don't have power over that. And so we have to show up fully daily. This is one of those talks that stick with you. This, is, this one's going to stick with me, and I hope it sticks with you as well. Our next speaker has an impactful story to tell. She shares what happens in life when life ignores your plans. Have we all been there? <laughs> life sometimes just ignores your plans. Alicia Smith has used her unique journey to encourage others to overcome seemingly insurmountable obstacles. This author, educator, and speaker will for sure inspire you. Please help me welcome Alicia Smith. Have you ever experienced a day that took a completely unexpected turn. I'm in the kitchen cleaning and wiping things down when suddenly I hear a loud noise. That comes from my three-year-old's room. I'm thinking, what has my beautiful, innocent little love done this time? I quickly run to her room. I walk through the door and I see that all of her alphabetized books have been pulled off the shelves and are now scattered all over the floor like a tornado tour through a library. Of course, I ask, what happened? And my sassy, quick-witted little girl gives me the most ingenious response. I don't know. I think it was Queen Barb. <laughs> now, Queen Barb isn't her imaginary friend, but she is a character from the animated movie Trolls 2. You know, Queen Barb, the bad guy. Now, after all this, what do you say when your child then says, Mommy, since I didn't make the mess, do I have to help clean it up? I'm sure some of you parents have fictional characters living in your house, too. Ten years before, I walked through a different kind of door. And this time, the loud sounds I heard weren't books falling to the floor. And when I looked around, I didn't see a child filling my life with laughter and delight. I was 21 in college on a dance scholarship, living my best life. I had been out with my friends on a typical warm and clear Arizona night. We had been at a large gathering that quickly became uncomfortable, so we decided to leave. I opened the door of my friend's car. As soon as I sat down, I heard a loud pop, pop. It almost sounded like fireworks in the distance. Immediately, the side of my abdomen began to burn. So I took my, cup, my hand and I cupped it over the spot that was on fire. Something warm started to seep in between my fingers. 
during the late hours of that night, darkness filled the car, so I had to take my hand and bring it up to my face to see what it was. It was blood. The odor of gunpowder filled the car. And it was that moment I realized I had been shot. My friend driving the car sped off to get me to the hospital as quickly as he could. And when he stopped at the first red light, I managed to faintly utter, you can't stop. If you stop, I'm going to die. So we picked up the pace, started running red light stop signs, weaving in and out of traffic like a NASCAR driver trying to save my life. I found out that I had a less than 1% chance of survival when I initially arrived to the hospital that night because not only had I been shot through the liver, but I had been shot through the liver with an AK-47. I had randomly been caught in the crossfire between two rival gangs. I had 15 abdominal surgeries in the span of three months, which left me immobile, subjecting me to physical, mental, and emotional torture. The torment slowly but ferociously crept its way through every nook and cranny of what was, what was left of my frail 85-pound body, leaving me feeling numb, helpless, and as though I may have been better off dead. Because the moment I was shot, was the moment I lost any recognition of the person I had been before, a vibrant, fearless, outgoing, independent young woman and dancer full of life and self-reliance with her whole life ahead of her. When I became clear-minded enough in the hospital to start to form thoughts, I started contemplating what my life might look like now. I wondered could I go back to my old self and regain some sense of normalcy? The struggle with these thoughts kept me in a deep and pervasive feeling of worthlessness and overwhelming despair. People had been assuring me that I could go back to the life that I once had. I was told I'd be okay, but I didn't feel okay. Then one day during my recovery, my mom offered me a different ingenious thought. And she said, I don't know what you're going through, but I do know that if you continue down this path you're on, it is going to make you a bitter person. In that moment, I knew I had to get my life back on track. I didn't want to be angry or bitter, and I was determined to not let this disrupt or control my life anymore. I genuinely believed that if I just worked hard enough, I could go back to the person that I once was. So I went back to college. I completed my studies and I graduated. Yes, it gave me back structure, routine, a sense of independence, but shortly after I graduated, I found myself unable to actually pursue the career I had gone to college for, and my dreams of becoming a professional dancer were gone. So I began intensive therapy. Therapy provided me with numerous coping mechanisms and strategies as I spent years trying to manage and address my anxiety, depression, and PTSD. And as a way to navigate and process my many unpredictable emotions, I wrote a book detailing my experience and shortly thereafter began to receive invitations to share my story all over the country. But None of these experiences brought me back to my former self. Over time, I came to the hard realization that my path in life had shifted. I struggled with what this altered trajectory would now be. I had to reassess my life goals, ambitions, and whole sense of self. 70% of adults will encounter some type of trauma during their lifetime. Experiencing trauma doesn't mean you have to be at war or be a survivor of a drive-by shooting. Trauma can be divorce, disease, neglect, even observing a loved one go through trauma themselves. 
anything that causes major change can be traumatic. And when we believe or we are told that we can go back to who we were, we're lying to ourselves. All of this took many, many years, but it led me to the idea that when we understand and accept our new self after trauma, then we can grow and we can take action towards living a more healthy life. This idea is how I fought back and what ultimately enabled me to genuinely begin progressing forward in my life. I discovered that I had to accept who and where I was right then. It was painful and difficult, but it was my reality. This kind of acceptance helps us create the space for the healing we so desperately need. I realized that with the understanding of this new reality, I had to change my perspective on things. When we adapt to these changes in our lives, it allows us to take control of our narrative instead of feeling victimized by it because we don't have to fall victim to our circumstances. I learned that the human experience is about continual growth, or as Abraham Maslow calls it, self-actualization, which is about becoming the best we can be. If we want to be healthy, we will do what it takes to grow. And trauma can be that powerful catalyst for personal growth, but that cannot happen when we are fighting to go back to the life we used to have. We don't have to be who we were. We have the opportunity to be someone new. The person I used to be didn't have to live with memories of a liver aneurysm or get heart palpitations because a door slammed too loud. The person I used to be enjoyed the 4th of July fireworks. The person I used to be had all of her colon and ribs and did not have the digestive tract of an eight-year-old. Trauma changes us, doesn't it? And healing from it is a complex and individualized process that only happens after acknowledging its impact and taking action. So when you or a loved one has experienced today that took a completely unexpected turn, I want us to undertake the challenging task of recognizing and embracing this new course. When I work with people, they usually ask me, so if you can't just tell someone everything's going to be okay, what do you do? I want to share four key steps that I find essential. One, show up. Be there when they need you. Call, text. Silent presence is healing. Two, listen. According to research, about 75% of people who enter talk therapy benefit just from having someone to talk to. So create an environment for someone to talk without expectation or judgment. Three, inquire. The goal here is to ask questions that help identify different aspects of the problem. In an unbiased way, help someone see the multiple perspectives. And four, support. Support by accepting their decisions, whether you agree with them or not, and encourage behaviors to overcome challenges. We all can do this. On our journey of self-acceptance, remember, healing doesn't mean forgetting your trauma. It's about finding a way to coexist with it. 
a way that allows us to embrace change, gain inner strength, and empowers us to lead a life filled with happiness and joy. So, as we leave here today, and we all journey through the countless doors in our lives, let's have the courage to bid farewell to our past selves and welcome a new chapter where acceptance of change becomes our greatest triumph. Thank you so much, Alicia. Overcoming and accepting change is definitely a powerful skill that we all need to lean into. We are all better when we are able to and unwilling to give up. And her story of not giving up empowers us all to move forward. This is an opportunity for us to take a break. We have an opportunity to digest <laughs> mentally, and now we want to get an opportunity to digest physically. And I'm going to turn it over to Gordon Bird, so that he can give you instructions for lunch. Thank you, Calvina. And uh, let's give a round of applause to all of our speakers. <laughs> Lots of incredible um, talks on the next chapter in life. And our next chapter in this event will be lunch. And uh, so if you will exit this way and then come back around the way that you walked in, we'll have lunch. It'll be served shortly, um, but feel free to mingle and, and chat. And I hope you get a chance to, uh, to meet and speak with our speakers. Thank you very much.
quick announcements to our online guests. We will be starting at 1 p.m. sharply. 1 p.m. once again. We will resume the TED Talks at Pembroke at 1 p.m. Thank you.
Good afternoon and welcome back. I'm Gordon Bird, one of the organizers for this year's TEDx UNCP Pembroke event. And uh, we're very, very thankful and uh, happy that you guys are all here. We have uh, our second session beginning uh, now and we couldn't be more excited about um, the last few talks that we have and our theme, the next chapter in life. Uh, so thank you again for coming and we expect you will enjoy. I am so excited to get back started. We will begin this session with the incomparable Jeanette Brene. This has been such an inspiring day. I'm going to leave like walking a little bit straighter, a little bit taller. I know you guys will as well. Our next speaker is a global keynote speaker, culture strategist, and growth mindset coach. If you are ready to leave your anxieties and aspirations to perfection behind, this is the talk you are waiting for. Help me welcome. Jeanette Brené. The call came on a Tuesday at 1 p.m. My mom was going through cancer treatment in Denmark. She had died on her way to the hospital. I was in my office in New York. I'd just talked to her that morning. She had trouble breathing, and I told her to hurry and call an ambulance. I never imagined that would be the last time I talked to her. It was the most difficult day of my life. Not only was I in shock, but I also had to tell my dad later that afternoon that we had lost her because he was on a flight from Denmark 
to New York to continue his cancer treatment. Yes, both my parents had cancer and they were in treatment at the same time in two different countries. That day, my life changed in a way I could never have planned for, and it became the ultimate lesson in navigating uncertainty. After about six months, it became clear that my dad wasn't going to make it either. We didn't know how much time he had left, but he challenged both of us to face our fears with curiosity and courage. <laughs> that, that was really his superpower. Even when I was a kid, he would never tell me what to do or not to worry when I was scared. Instead, he would encourage me to tell him all about it. And he would listen to my stories about the monsters and ask me what I would do to chase them away. When I was a little bit older and doubted myself, he would ask me questions and help me find my way forward by giving him three reasons why it mattered to me. Even at the end of his life, he continued asking questions and encouraged me to do the same. We talked about our memories, what we cared about, and what it meant to live a good life. It wasn't easy. First, we had to acknowledge our fears and insecurities. Then, we had to accept the harsh reality that he was dying. But then, then we could ask, what do we need so that we can make this time we have left the most meaningful it can be? It completely changed our conversations, and it transformed how I live my life still today. At different stages in life, we ask the question, what's next? As a child, my curiosity for life was unstoppable. I was constantly wondering what's next, to the point that my dad would say, hey, slow down. What's wrong with this moment? But as a teenager, this natural curiosity and excitement for learning turned into a need for knowing. I became obsessed with perfection as a way to try to control my life. Instead of being full of wonder, I became filled with worry. And the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt clouded my perspective. So much so that my dad would ask, what's wrong with making a mistake? As my career grew and I took on leadership positions, my anxiety grew too. And with that came burnout, not just once, but twice. And my dad would ask, what are you chasing? Maybe you can relate. Being so worried about the future that you feel burned out just, worry, uh, just thinking about it. Being so concerned about making the right decision that you don't make one. Being so overwhelmed about what to do that you don't do anything? We live at a time where we have more opportunities than ever, and yet we struggle to make decisions that unlock our potential. Teenagers are struggling with anxiety to figure out what's next, what to do with the rest of their lives, and what college to go to. The sandwich generation is trying to figure out how to take care of their kids, their aging parents, and navigate the middle of their careers while also trying to get through each day. Mass layoffs are prompting us to consider leaving the corporate world and become entrepreneurs, pursue our dreams. And somewhere along the way, we also have to plan for retirement. But social construct is pushing us to have a life plan. And yet, we can judge ourselves pretty harshly when things don't go as planned. I know I did. But as my dad and I looked back over our lives, he at the end and me in the middle, I realized that our values and what we care about and what a success means to us change as we grow through life. And if that's the case, shouldn't we be more open to changing our plans too? With burnout on the rise, even among teenagers, we must stop and ask ourselves, what does a good life mean to me? What do I care about? Truly care about. In my research on the relationship between peak performance and burnout, two findings stand out. First, our health and happiness has little to do with titles and money. It comes from our connection with other people, our continued growth and doing work we care about. Secondly, we don't just burn out from working too much. 
We burn out from worrying too much, feeling that we don't matter and that we're not safe. So how do we stay curious so we can keep learning and growing? How do we face our fears so that we can move forward with clarity and confidence? How do we cultivate meaningful relationships with ourselves and each other? And how do we align our lives with what we care about so that we can harness our future? See, we humans like to know what's ahead. We like to be prepared. We crave certainty. And yet, the future is uncertain. It always will be. We cannot control what happens. We can only control how we respond to what happens in the here and now. Now, we know this intellectually, but how do we embrace it emotionally so that we can explore the possibilities of life instead of getting stuck, resisting the discomfort that comes from change and uncertainty? The answer lies in what I call power pausing. Power pausing is that small moment, that gap in time, where we can pause, listen, and ask more questions where we can take back our power of choice and turn reaction into response, turn fear into curiosity, turn confusion into clarity and anxiety into confidence. It's easy to be scared. But how can we use this power pause every moment, all day long, to pause and choose what we pay attention to. Every moment is an opportunity to reconnect with ourselves and choose how we want to move forward. See, our minds are question-making machines. We constantly ask questions. They're so busy, our thoughts are coming and going. It's like a hamster running on a wheel. And that hamster on the wheel that internal chatter can either work for us or against us. Under stress, our attention is hijacked by perceived danger and we focus on what's not working rather than being curious about how to make it work. We ask questions like, why is this not working? We become why nutters. Why can't I figure this out? Why am I not able to do this? Asking why not questions can keep us even more stuck, confused, and overwhelmed. So to stop this hamster wheel and, and, and break free from being why notters and stop asking the question, why am I not able to, why can't I? We must pause and change the question to, what am I trying to achieve? Why does it matter to me? And what do I need so that I can do that? That question, what do I need so that I can do that, redirects our attention. You can think of this way. If you're driving down the street, all that FUD is like a big, giant pothole. The FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. If you keep looking at it, you're going to hit it, especially if you're on your bicycle or motorcycle. You must avoid the pothole. You must look in the direction you're going and keep your attention and your focus on what you're driving towards. That's the power of the mind. Our intention fuels our attention. I know, it sounds easy. It's not always easy. When my dad and I, I remember the day we were at the doctor's office and we were told, it was time to get his affairs in order. There's no longer anything they could do to stop his cancer from spreading. We looked at each other and we thought, how is this possible? And yet we had to accept this reality to stop feeling powerless and take back our power of choice so that we can choose how we wanted to spend the time he had left. Because he was scared of dying, instead of ignoring those fears, we decided to learn more about the dying process, and we asked someone to come and talk to us about it. That gave us back agency over how we spent each day. So every morning, we would check in and say, how are you doing? 
And then we would ask, what do you need, what do we need, so that we can make this day the best it can be? Staying curious about our fears and talking about what we cared about allowed us to connect more deeply with each other and with ourselves. But power pausing isn't just for these big, life-altering events and moments. Every day, we can pause, listen, ask more questions. We can reclaim agency over how we think, how we engage with each other and ourselves, and how we therefore act and make decisions in the world. That question, what do I need so that I can, changes how we look for answers and find our way forward. So if you're tired, you can ask, what do I need so I can have more energy? If I'm critical, what do I need so I can be more curious? If I feel overwhelmed, what do I need so I can make better priorities? If I feel scared, what do I need so I have more courage? Confused, what do I need so I have more clarity? And if I am distracted, what do I need so I can be more mindful and present? We have become so conditioned to look outside of ourselves for the answers to our health and happiness. And we search online to find out what to do with our lives instead of digging deeper into our relationship with ourselves so we can unlock our potential instead of fitting into someone else's idea of what a good life looks like. I want to remind you of something. Being human is not a problem to solve. We're not broken. You're not broken. We don't need to get fixed. Being human is an advantage to unlock and harness. And this human advantage lies in our ability to pause, listen, and ask discerning questions with the same curiosity that humanity has used to evolve and innovate for centuries. It's normal to feel fear. Fear has been a constant partner in my life, and it still is. It's easy to judge ourselves when we worry. But what we worry about is also what we care about. And what we care about makes us stronger. What we care about is the essence of a good life. The greatest gift my dad gave me was to face my fears by asking questions with curiosity and care. To unlock our human advantage, we must stop letting fear run our lives, and instead cultivate an agile growth mindset where we navigate uncertainty and harness change. Power pausing has changed my life. It's how I learned to live more intentionally and transform my fear into clarity and confidence so I could face whatever is next over and over again. I invite you to let it change your life too. May the pause be with you. I'm confident that I'm gonna let the pause be with me. <laughs> I will from now on lean into the power pause. It works. The pause gives, gives us our power back over the moment. You know how things rush up on you and sometimes you get lost, but it give, gives us our power back over that moment. Instead of falling prey to whatever automatic response we have, we can feel powerful anyway. We will never find happiness outside of ourselves. I love that. I love leaning into that idea. I'm so thankful to Jeanette for reminding us that the power to pause is within us. And guess what? We are not broken. I love that. I always say, tell people that I offer wholeness to brokenness. You don't respond to brokenness with brokenness. You respond in wholeness. That's beautiful. I know I'm inspired. Our next speaker is Michelle Thorstad. She is a motivational speaker at Remedy LLC dedicated to guiding individuals through life's challenges with passion and inspiration. Prepare yourself to be transformed and inspired. Please help me welcome Michelle Thorstad. Oh. 
A wise woman once told me that emotional pain is like a gift standing at your doorstep waiting for you to open it. Now you can choose to receive the gift or you can choose to resist it. But if you choose not to receive it, it's still standing at your door. Try as you may to walk around it. You're going to keep running into it. Why not open it up and examine what it has to offer you? At the time, I couldn't appreciate her metaphor. I was happily married, had three kids, a dog, a house, and a picket fence. I was living my best life. Little did I know that four years later, the gift of emotional pain would arrive at my doorstep in the form of divorce papers. And when it came, I didn't recognize it as a gift. So instead of receiving it, I resisted it. And unfortunately, this was a pattern of mine. When faced with hard situations, I often sought to distract myself to avoid the emotional pain. You know, things like shopping, eating, Netflix. Those were my go-to numbing agents. But it didn't make sense. I mean, in my own community, I was the one that everyone called when they needed advice on how to navigate their struggles. Yet here I was, avoiding my own. It was easy for me to deal with other people's emotional pain. But when it came time to dealing with my own, not so much. It was a little too close for comfort. Emotional pain forces us to explore the deepest places within us because that's where the pain is buried. Who in their right mind wants to go digging that up? Not me. But pain and suffering is a part of the human experience. No one is excluded from it, and no one's getting out of it. I certainly didn't. When those divorce papers showed up at my doorstep that day, I just couldn't bring myself to open them. In a moment of truth, I found myself sobbing on the floor. I could no longer blind myself to my husband's addictions or my own codependency issues. In my pain, I cried out, what did I do to deserve this? You'd think that 15,000 hours of training and mental health would have prepared me for this. But nothing prepares you for when it's happening to you. I had been battling for so long, trying to keep my family together, trying to control the situation to prevent the aftermath of pain that would follow if my husband and I were to separate. I was utterly exhausted. And looking at those divorce papers made it clear that not only had my efforts failed, but that gift of pain was already here. Curled up on the doorstep, it dawned on me trying to make sense of how I got to this place was keeping me from realistically confronting it. I was spiraling into a depression, and I knew I needed to do something to keep myself from completely unraveling. Just then, I remembered a corporate slogan from years ago that said something like, when life brings you a challenging situation, if you can't get out of it, Get into it. What if 
instead of trying to avoid my pain, what if I embraced it as a gift? Then maybe I could grow from it and thrive in the next chapter of my life. That thought led me to, or, to volunteer at an organization whose mission was to end hopelessness among teens. I showed up my first night, and there was an overwhelming sense of love and belonging in that room that I had never experienced before. The kids were laughing and hugging and playing games and teasing each other, and my first thought was, I must be in the wrong place because these kids do not look hopeless. I sat in support group that night and listened as teens shared their most vulnerable, painful experiences. And I realized these kids are exposing their souls. And in doing so, there was a sense of intimacy and connection that was being created. They compassionately supported one another which was completely countercultural to what our society teaches us about avoiding emotional pain, and even more so about expressing it openly. Yet repeated studies show that when we share our suffering in the safe presence of others, it meets our deep need to be fully seen and fully known. Furthermore, the weight of the pain is alleviated as others come along and help us to carry it. Psychiatrist Kirk Thompson says the degree to which our pain persists is directly correlated to the degree that we remain alone in our pain. He says the brain can do a great deal of work for a long time, as long as it doesn't have to do it by itself. I remember thinking that night, man, if these kids who have dealt with more pain and heartbreak in their short lives than I've ever experienced, can open up and be real about what they're going through. Maybe I can do it too. During my volunteer time, I witnessed how this reality was unwrapping itself in my life as well as the teens. By naming and feeling our pain, we were allowing ourselves to receive it, to be honest with it, to connect with it, and to find ways to coexist with it. Instead of trying to avoid it, together we were finding ways through it. And in doing so, we were developing healthy coping skills and forming deep relationships. And the best part of all, we were finding joy in the middle of our pain. What a gift. Equally important is how we perceive life's challenges. In the article, The Principle of Receiving, it states that people have a choice to receive or resist what life brings them. When we welcome the pain brought on by hurtful circumstances, we open ourselves up to experience its potential positive impact on our lives. It can become a gift. Over the next decade, as I mentored and counseled people through their pain and trauma, I noticed that my own perspective on pain was starting to shift. I noticed that emotional pain was yielding yet another gift, the gift of resilience. Despite facing incredibly tough circumstances, my clients and these teens continued to show up ready to fight another day. It was like their struggles were transforming them into incredibly resilient individuals. As I observed this pattern, I realized that leaning into our pain can actually work in our favor. And not only is this true of human nature, but nature itself operates by this very same principle. Grapes, for instance, must go through a difficult season to become a vintage wine. To do this, farmers will intentionally stress the vines by withholding irrigation. This forces the roots to dive deeper into the soil to find moisture. In doing so, they uncover rich nutrients and minerals that they never would have discovered otherwise. This process 
yields an exquisite flavor of wine. Similarly, during the difficult season of my divorce, leaning into my pain yielded an unexpected growth within me. I was becoming a better version of myself, more, away, more aware and more self-resilient. Looking back, I hardly even recognize the person I used to be. I used to be so full of fear and insecure and constantly seeking other people's approval. But now, I have a newfound confidence in myself and no longer seek external validation to feel okay. I finally understood the wise woman's metaphor. When we embrace emotional pain as a gift, we can transform past the pain, grow from it, and thrive in the next chapter of our life. Instead of pain being the enemy, it can become a powerful motivator to find healthy ways to navigate hardships. It can lead us to find community, for others to come alongside us and help carry that pain and help us to find joy in the process. And it fosters resilience. Just like lifting weights strengthens our muscles, processing through difficult emotions strengthens our emotional resilience and ability to persevere. Now of teenagers, whose brains are not yet formed for critical thinking, can address and confront their painful experiences, we can do it too. And now, I'd like to invite you to take action in your own life to prepare you for when the gift of emotional pain arrives at your doorstep. After you leave here today, I want you to actively seek opportunities to find community or deepen your current relationships. Go through your phone contacts and pick one or two people that you trust and ask them if they'd be willing to be your accountability partner. Commit to doing regular heart checks together by naming two to three emotions that you've experienced recently and the reasons behind them. If you don't have anyone like that in your life right now, find a counselor or a support group to join. When emotional pain arrives at your doorstep, don't try to walk around it. Don't close your eyes and hope it goes away. Instead, try opening it up and see what it has to offer you. You may just find a vintage wine. You may just find yourself. You may just find a gift. Michelle did a good job at leaving us with lots of gifts. All the nuggets that she gave us today are just incredible. From this day forward, we will do a couple of things. We will see the challenges, changes, and promises of life as a gift. We're, we're going to receive those things and say, let's do this. And we're going to embrace them. Leaning on those who love us help us accomplish this goal. Sometimes we forget that. We live in a culture where people are pushing us to kind of do it on our own, and I don't need anybody, but it doesn't work. And Michelle reminded us of that. Pain is a part of life. All these nuggets. Oh, I feel like so full. We just had lunch, but I feel even bigger. Well, I mean, I got other reasons to feel a little bigger, but, you know, get them a little mixed up. So pain is a part of life, and resisting it only increases its intensity. I won't let that happen to me. I'm going to like, pain, let's do this. I'm going to handle it. So... Let's move on to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Michelle. That was good. We all love athletes, right? Like, I know I love an athlete. I try to keep it together. 
you know, after baby number six, we'll see what happens. Their discipline, their commitment and sacrifice inspires us all. We're so amazed by athletes. Our next speaker is Mandy, Mandy DeMarzo. This incredible speaker has been a passionate athlete her whole life. I love that. From Division I soccer to, to triathlons, Mandy has perfected pushing her physical limits. She now inspires others to do the same, not just physically, but mentally. Help me welcome Mandy DeMarzo. Every morning, I was injecting myself with a needle into my thigh because I wasn't able to bring a fork to my mouth. A vivid reminder of my battle fought silently behind closed doors. In the emptiness of my bathroom, I faced the harsh truth of my life. My legs, marked with bruises, showed the fight that I was in, struggling even to handle the needle's prick. The strong athlete I thought I saw in the mirror was just an illusion, hidden by how fragile I really was. There, I faced the harrowing truth, the treatment that promised elderly their mobility in weeks made no difference to my 25-year-old body. This wasn't just rock bottom. It was a silent plea for a truce in my war with myself. Every single calorie counted and every bead of sweat shed, I realized exactly how I got here. So what if I told you anorexia saved my life? Yes, debilitating disease that affects your psychological and physical well-being and could eventually kill you saved my life. No one would ever expect to hear those words. I have learned the person that loses themselves in order to find themselves knows that this is not where their story ends. It can actually be where their real story begins, your next chapter. More than ever, outside pressures of today's world are having a huge impact on our teen women and young adults. According to the National Institute of Health, 50% of teenage girls have unhealthy weight control habits and eating disorders. 40% have claimed that social media and body image are often to blame. And Amen Clinics now shows that anorexia is the number one killer of mental health diseases. This is our opportunity as a community to change the stigma surrounding anorexia and eating disorders and see what we can learn from them. Today, I invite you to change your perspective around your own stigmas surrounding your thoughts. We all have them. Anorexia showed me the path to mental freedom. Your body keeps score, so why not rig that score in your favor? Here are my five vulnerable truths that prove our darkest moments are actually shedding light on where we need to be going. These are the same truths that showed me how my own anorexia saved my life. Number one, my definition of strong was all wrong. Our traditional definition of strong focuses on physical demands associated with lifting heavy weights and building muscle but what about the time I was in my orthopedic surgeon's office amidst a litany of broken bones, torn ligaments, and yet I insisted on running 14 miles that morning, ignoring his advice for rest. I had mistaken constant pain for progress. I once misunderstood strength, seeing it in rigid, narrow terms. My definition of strong was all wrong. True strength, however, is found in rest, in attuning to one's body, in mental fortitude, 
and most profoundly, in the complete acceptance of oneself. That's a big leap from our traditional definition of strong to a deeper personal kind. Number two, celebrating daily wins builds monumental achievement. Each day, humans are faced with over 35,000 choices alone, yet all it takes are a few simple ones to create monumental change. My recovery started in the minutia. So I changed my routine of tracking every calorie consumed and burned to journaling three positive, strong daily choices. Whether that's a rest day, trying new food, or just showing myself some grace. This shift sparked a journal full of momentum, fueling my newfound strength. These are the little things that count the most. Number three, longevity is not an age. Anorexia and exercise addiction taught me it's not all about the numbers, not in age or in weight or in calories burned or in miles per hour and heart rate and PRs and all that I measured my athletic success on. At the pinnacle of my athletic prowess, winning marathons, shattering personal records, my bones told a different story. A bone scan revealed that I had the skeletal structure of an 88-year-old's fragility housed in a 25-year-old's body. Today, I no longer wear watches or heart rate monitors when I work out. I have gotten away from those numbers, and I go by the feels. Longevity means more than just counting years. It's about vitality and meaningful growth. Each year is a chance to grow a stronger, more beautiful version of yourselves. After all, survival is not a way of living. Number four, don't bite the hand that feeds you, especially your own. I equated strength with running over 110 miles weekly and minimizing my food intake to the brink of collapse, convinced that such extremes were the price of worthiness. I selected calorie restriction and excessive exercise as my chosen means of self-punishment. With this body, I have accomplished tremendous things. My speed, endurance, agility, tenacity is what provoked me to be who I am. And yet here I was depleting it and abusing it so it could no longer do what it's meant to do. My journey has encouraged me to bring diversity to my wellness footprint. How I move, what I eat, who I'm influenced by, like social media, who I lend my ear to and my energy to. Where I invest is what grows. So by keeping the menu diverse, it keeps me vital. And finally, number five, you cannot travel the world if you can't get out of your own way. Being trapped in your own mind can imprison you tighter than any physical bounds. My obsession with exercise, diet, and the minutia of my routine prevented me from vital exploration and self-discovery. My own limiting beliefs became my own worst enemy. Once I removed them, life came to me rather than me escaping life. I want to disrupt our perception of anorexia and eating disorders. Diseases are not meant to kill us. They're meant to save us. This is not just about anorexia. This is about anyone struggling with their definition of strong. This is for the parents struggling with their child, not because they are the cause, 
but because they want to be part of the solution. This is for the educators struggling to find the right words and soften this moment, but they don't know exactly how. This is for the coaches to let their players know they are not alone and they will provide as much support off the field as they do on the field. This is for the best friend who rides shotgun for all the good times and the fun memories, but wants to be there for the hard times too. And this is for society to change stigma. Through my struggle with anorexia, I discovered an undeniable truth. Our deepest challenges hold the power to redefine us, to forge strength, resilience, and courage we never knew we had. I believe it's never too late to author a new chapter in our lives. By sharing the lessons that I have learned, I aim to light the way for others. After all, we are most qualified in life to help the person that we once were. Every story is worth telling. I hope this gives you that permission to tell yours. The world really is listening. This fork used to be my biggest enemy. And now it is my greatest source of strength. Thank you. All right, Mandy helped us reshape our idea of strong. Isn't that one of those ideas that gets in the way often, trying to look strong? Strong can just be all wrong when it means being disconnected from our deeper truth. That was so good. I'm just so excited for her. There is a beauty inside of all of us that we often overlook. And we are so grateful to Mandy for reminding us of that, that we don't need to try to look like we always have it together. Being present with what's deeper inside of us is what's beautiful about us. So that brings us to our final speaker. Oh my gosh, y'all excited? Our final speaker has made a powerful impact in business and in life. Today, he is a serial entrepreneur, best-selling author, and real estate expert. His success story does not give us a full picture of his exceptional journey. Settle in and prepare to be healed and push for greatness even when the deck is stacked against you. Please help me welcome Brian Will. One billion dollars. That is the peak value of the companies that I have founded or co-founded. That's not bad for a kid who failed out of high school at 16. The last 35 years, I have launched 10 different startups, five different industries. Two of those I sold to venture capital groups. One I sold to private equity. A couple of those companies failed, and even today I still have three operating companies. I'm a pilot, flew my own plane here today. I'm a dive master, I've traveled the world, walked the Great Wall of China, and I've run with the bulls in Spain. But my story today is not about success. My story today is about child abuse, pain, and failure. And I have four messages for you today. So let's get started. My story starts in kindergarten, and both of my parents worked, and I had a babysitter that lived next door, and he would pick me up from school, and he would take me back to his house, and I would stay there until my parents got home. And he would tell me that if I told my parents what he was doing, I would be in big trouble. Because you see, that's what child sexual predators do. They blame the child. Up until about the age of 12, uh, I lived in fear pretty much every day of my life. Because I knew that if my mother left the house, my stepfather would come looking for me. And he liked to hit. 
And he would tell me that if I told my mother, it would be 10 times worse. Remember when I was 16, I was standing in the front yard and getting yelled at, which was a pretty typical day for me. But on this particular day, I snapped. And I started yelling back. And I told him that I hated him. I hated everything about him. And I would never be like him. And boom, down I went. And I'll never forget these words because they're burned into my brain. You are nothing more than a stupid effing 16-year-old kid, and you will never amount to anything. And you better not get up because I will take you out. So I just laid there and cried. I stopped going to school that year. I think I missed 32 days that first semester. I was late another 12. Didn't care anymore. I did manage to graduate, however, with a 1.2 GPA. And I remember that next year as graduation was approaching, my stepfather came into my room one night and he said, this is my house and you are not welcome here. When you graduate, you need to leave. Now I'm 17 going on 18, where am I gonna go? And I hated him and I hated everything and I hated my life and I had authority problems like you wouldn't believe and I hated being told what to do. So I joined the military because that seemed like a good idea. Now, I was on active duty for about a year. I was in the National Guard, and I came back to my hometown. I was 19 years old, and it was time to go to work. So over the next two years, I started working. The problem was I also got fired a lot. I got fired working in a warehouse. I got fired working on a construction crew. I got fired making pizzas. I got a job as a waiter. And I worked my first double shift on a Sunday, and I'll never forget, at the end of 12 hours, we're doing our checkout, if anybody's ever been a waiter, and I'm adding up all my tickets and how much money I've got to see how much money I made in tips. Not only did I not make any money after 12 hours, I owed the restaurant $6. I don't know what happened. But I do know that the owner of the restaurant came over and sat down with me, and he said, Brian, you might want to consider a different career. Waiting tables is just above your pay grade. So I got a job as a busboy. I was 21 years old, and I was a busboy. And my girlfriend was a waitress. And we had a good idea. We should get married. So we quit our jobs. And we moved back up to Ohio, where we were from, and we got married. The problem is, in Ohio, we didn't have jobs. Didn't have a place to live. I didn't even own a car. So I took my new wife, and I moved in with my grandmother. And I took a job mowing grass making $4 an hour. I was 22 years old, about the same age as most of the kids in this university. I was 22 years old, living with my grandmother and a day labor, making four bucks an hour. Nobody was looking at me, thinking, you know what? One day, that guy, he's gonna be huge. So, I took this job mowing grass, and I had an epiphany while I was out there, because after a couple of weeks, we were mow some grass, get a check, mow some grass, get a check. And I remember sitting in this truck one day thinking, this doesn't take any education, this doesn't take any job skills. I could start my own business, and I could be rich and successful mowing grass. And I got excited about this opportunity, and I went and I took my mother to lunch, and I told her about my grand plans of business ownership and, and wealth and riches and success. And I'll never forget, my mother looked me in the eye that day and she said, Brian, you need to lower your expectations in life because you are not going to be rich and successful. Starting a business is a bad idea. You need to get a job. And I was so angry with her that day because my own mother didn't believe in me. I was so angry with her because she may as well have told me that I was a loser and I would never amount to anything. I was so angry I didn't talk to her for another year. But I did start that business. And over the next eight years, me and my wife struggled. But then we started doing good. And we did good right up until we didn't. And I didn't know what I was doing in business. I made every mistake in the book. And when I was 30 years old, that business collapsed. And I lost everything. I lost the house I had bought. They came and repossessed my cars. They turned my electricity off. The bank sent me a letter that said, Mr. Will, you've bounced 130 checks at our branch. We are closing your account. You are no longer welcome here. Please do not come back. Oh, and by the way, that's my daughter you see up there. We also found out at the same time she has something called atrial septal defect, which is a hole in her heart. 
and she needed open heart surgery at the age of three. If you see the patch on her eye, we also found out at the same time she was going blind in one eye. Now, when I lost my business, I lost my health insurance. I had no way to pay for this. I was 30 years old. I was a complete failure. I couldn't pay my bills, and I could not take care of my child. And I was angry. And I hated everybody, and I hated everything, and I hated myself, and I blamed everybody in my past. But you see, it's times like this when you need to take a step back and start doing some self-realization. And you need to ask yourself some questions. What are you going to do now? Where are you going to go from here? How are you going to deal with your past and with your failure? You see, most people that go through childhood trauma or childhood abuse, they don't talk about it. They don't talk about it because they're ashamed of it. Or they're afraid. They're afraid they're going to be judged. I'd been married for eight years. I had never told my wife about my childhood. I didn't want her to think I was weak. I wanted to be strong and confident, even though I was a mess inside. So I hid my pain in anger. And I used that anger to try and dominate people. I didn't want your pity. I wanted you to fear me. Because in my mind, domination and fear was the opposite of weakness. Remember that stepfather standing above me yelling at me lying on the ground crying. That's domination, and that's weakness. It's not what I wanted. But here's the thing. Nothing that happened to you as a child is your fault. Nothing. But as an adult, and we are all adults here, as an adult, if you allow those things to affect the rest of your life, then that is your fault. You need to start taking responsibility in your life for the things that you are not responsible for. And you need to get the help that you need. This brings me to my first message today. If you have suffered through childhood trauma and abuse and you have not talked to somebody about it, you need to talk to somebody about it. Could be a friend, could be an advisor, should be a counselor. But you need to talk to somebody so that you can get those things out in the open and start dealing with them so that they, not, they will not affect the rest of your life. In my particular case, I didn't go to counseling back then. Should have. I didn't go to counseling until years later, and I only ended up in counseling because my childhood trauma cost me a marriage, and my wife left me. And the very same week she left me, I found out that the man I thought was my father, the man whose name is on my birth certificate, is not my father. You see, I'm a product of an affair. My mother was married, had an affair, got pregnant, divorced the guy she was married to, married the abusive stepfather, and they all knew and they all lied to me and nobody told me about it. And I didn't find out till I was in the middle of a divorce. You see, I was the guy that would never go through counseling. That was for weak people. And I was not going to be weak. That was for talking to some counselor. I mean, why, why would I do that? But I will tell you this. After three years of counseling, it made me a better person. It made me a better man. It made me a better CEO. But back to my story. I'm 30 years old. I'm a complete failure. Can't pay for anything. But here's the greatest success secret in life I'm about to give to you. When everything in your life is falling apart, you've heard this on stage today, when everything in your life is falling apart, you take one step forward and you keep moving. You take another step forward and you keep moving. Just don't stop. And that's what I did. My landscaping business fell apart. I started selling insurance. And three years from a complete failure, I sold that insurance agency to a venture capital group for a million dollars. I was a millionaire. And I went on after that and started another company, and we sold it to another venture capital group. I started, to a started a third company. We sold it to a private equity group. That was an $80 million transaction. I went on and wrote four books. Two became Wall Street Journal bestsellers. Not bad for a kid who failed English. Today, I own a chain of restaurants, a consulting company. I own a real estate company, and I ran for city council in my hometown and got elected. And that was surreal. A kid who failed out of high school running a city. But my story is not about success. My story is about overcoming the demons in your head telling you that you can't move on. You see, I could have stayed a busboy. I was good at it. I could have stayed mowing grass. I was good at that. But there was something in my head 
saying, Brian, this is not the end of your story. This is not where you're going to end up. And that brings me to my second message. I have found that people that go through childhood trauma and abuse tend to go down one of three paths. The first path is that the child who is abused becomes an adult who is an abuser. And the cycle continues. The second group never heal from that trauma. They never get the help they need, and it breaks them, and they spend their life doing nothing. And that third group, you find this with a lot of high-performing individuals. They take that pain and that trauma, and they channel it, and they turn it into fuel, and they use that fuel to break that family cycle and take their life in an entirely new direction. I will tell you that if you have suffered through any type of trauma or abuse, Maybe it's time that you figured out how to channel it and break that cycle in your life and take your life in an entirely new direction. You see, I didn't know any of this when I was that age. All I knew at the time was that I was angry and I had something to prove. I had something to prove to the kids who laughed at me, the teachers who failed me, to my parents who told me I never amount to anything. I had something to prove to everybody in my past. But it's funny, after three years of counseling, I came to a realization. None of those people had thought about me in years and didn't care about me one way or another. They were busy dealing with their own own problems in life. What I came to realize when I looked in the mirror was that there was only one person who still thought I was a loser. There was only one person who still looked at me as that kid laying in the front yard crying, and that was me. I had to prove something to myself. I had to take responsibility for the things in my life that I was not responsible for, and I had to get the help to figure out how to overcome it. And that brings me to my final message. Whatever you think is holding you back in life is probably not what's holding you back. It may slow you down, but if you will make the decision to get the help you need to overcome those demons, you can go on and achieve anything you want to achieve in your life. My message is simple. You cannot change the past, but you can change the future. Your past, if you so choose, is not your future. You and you alone get to determine what the next chapter of your life is going to look like. Thank you. What a way to end this power-packed event. Brian taught us to be willing to take chances and to push past limiting experiences and beliefs. I am just so grateful that you guys spent your afternoon, your morning with us. I think I just totally enjoyed myself. I hope you did as well. But before we go, I want to take the opportunity to thank our organizers. Can y'all help me clap for them just a little bit? I'm going to bring them up in a second. I know, well, running my own enterprise called my family. This is baby number six. It's an enterprise. I know this takes a lot of effort and skill to accomplish, and so I just wanted to bring up Gordon Berg. Can y'all clap for Gordon, our organizer? Rodney Smith, thank you, thank you, thank you. Ale Abudeya. Yay! And Tarilla Aduma. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Calvina, for, for hosting this event. Thank you all for coming. Thank you again to our speakers. Can we have another round of applause for our speakers? This has been a wonderful day, and we could not be more thankful that uh, you were here to join us, and it went so well, and we are uh, internally grateful for all of uh, the the good people who helped us along the way. Can't name them all, but I want a special shout out to our our Chancellor, Chancellor Cummings, for uh, seeing the vision here and, and, and believing in it and supporting it as he did. Also, the Lumberton Visitors Bureau for sponsoring us in this, as well as uh, PostNet in Lumberton and Sodexo, who made the wonderful food that we enjoyed today. A round of applause for our sponsors. Thank you again for joining us, and uh, I hope you have a wonderful day as you look forward to the next chapter in your life. Thank you. Thank you.